Hey guys, and welcome to the channel. I'm Mark Thomas Shaw. I'm the executive director here at Contemplative Light and author of the book Dante's Road, The Journey Home for the Modern Soul. And in this video, we're going to take a look at the five stages of the classical journey of awakening or what was called toward divine union. So today we talk about awakening oneness, non-duality. Maybe we're in, into Eastern traditions and they talk about Advaita Vedanta. Uh, there's all kinds of terms today with this infusion of uh, this multiple traditions, East and West, that give different models, metaphors, and images for spiritual progress, progress along the spiritual path. In the West, we usually go back to European theology. St. Anthony of the Desert, this kind of begins, and then it's articulated and set down the kind of uh, Christian mysticism, you know, first in a kind of uh, form of stages by St. Dionysius the Areopagite. And then it's kind of subtly refined in the writings of Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross in the ascent of Mount Carmel. And then it is codified by later authors in like even the 20th century, people like Evelyn Underhill, Father Thomas Keating, and so on, who kind of keep these ancient monastic traditions alive and then kind of pass them along to the laity outside of the walls of, of the monastery. Now, most Westerners anymore are more familiar with Protestant theology, evangelicalism, um, has a much more sort of a, a, a higher impact sort of PR driven, seeker sensitive churches were a big thing in, in America in the 80s after the Jesus people, um, in evangelicalism, and you have the rise of kind of modern mega churches. And Protestantism though is based on the written word and the individual relationship to that written word where you it's all about your relationship to Jesus and ensuring you go to heaven because you are saved. But in the older Catholic traditions, it was just that. There's this tradition of a spirituality that is contemplative. And once you have this break into Protestantism that's mostly based on my or our reading of the Bible and the conceptual theology that we build as a value system to cling to that we that situates us over against this other thing that we feel like has devolved into meaninglessness. There is a uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater where you're trying to reject the bad but in doing so you reject some of the good as well that that tradition has preserved a contemplative spirituality that in Protestantism for a long time that um, uh, via negativa the apophatic way kind of wasn't there and it took a while for that to re-emerge for Protestants also just because of sort of postmodernism and cross-pollination and and those rigid categories that we divide the world up to with a modernist mindset so it took basically uh, this cross-pollination and cross-fertilization often happens in college. Protestants have kids too. Protestants want kids to go to college and there they might interface with people from Anglican traditions or Catholic traditions or people who just um, in their studies uh, and, and, and academic pursuits came across these figures. Uh, a Thomas Merton has kept these traditions alive uh, in the popular consciousness now. They've always been there in facets of Catholicism. It's just about this learning and, and cross fertilization. So St. Dionysius the Areopagite had three stages. Purgation, illumination, and divine union. So all of these, by the way, have as their end divine union. All of the stages of spiritual development in the contemplative Western tradition, in 
mystical Christianity lead toward this omega point of divine union. Interestingly, if you start to read widely in different traditions, the word yoga, for example, means union. You start to see the connecting points between, say, mystical Christianity, Sufism, some of the Zen tradition, uh, even some like Jewish Kabbalah, and other traditions entirely that Aldous Huxley called and Richard Rohr picks up on called the perennial tradition. So that's a term that people often use these days just to encapsulate that whole bundle. Regardless of tradition, the purpose of the teaching and practice and journey is the same of this divine union. Now that's a little bit different from universalism and, and, and salvation that people get theologically hung up on, but on the mystical path, there is a lot of overlap and crossover. So St. Dionysius had his three stages of the path, but then other people kind of built on that and elaborated and felt it was maybe a little too lean. So later articulators of the contemplative Christian classical stages of spiritual development tended to kind of have as their Rubicon the night of sense where you were all in you had committed to not just praying and devotional every so often but a life transformed by prayer as your essential mode of being and your inmost being that is a firm decision you have made to head in that direction and be transformed by that process understanding that as much as you that might exert diligence and discipline the whole thing is a grace that is pulling you along the hunger for the 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 transformation in the first place whatever wounds that guided you to a point of making crossing that threshold and making the firm decision to move your life in that direction maybe enter a monastery maybe not but that first stage is the night of sense which means you assess closely as you pray in a contemplative mode or a discursive mode you are attending closely throughout your everyday life to where you look for happiness what are the pleasures you pursue or maybe even act out in addictive ways and those are usually at the lower levels of consciousness concupiscent meaning they are sort of lower levels of pleasure food sex um, gossip uh, the, the kind of lower levels that we all understand people get caught up in it's, it's kind of immature pleasure-seeking egocentric lifestyle which, which is common we and I dare say we all go through that that phase uh, and depending on and it just manifests in different ways so this first part is about attending to being present with, recognizing, becoming aware, and voluntarily releasing or refraining from. So the night of sense is this withdrawal from sensual pleasure. And that moves us into purgation. This state where the inner stuff that we run from in our everyday activities is being purged is being flushed out is coming to the surface this is where we feel deeply whatever pain we're avoiding and one dictum in the spiritual path is for healing to occur you've got to feel that pain that repressed anger that abandonment that loneliness that rejection whatever the stacked emotional issues are that that repel us toward seeking out objects or experiences of pleasure to avoid that stuff 
that nevertheless drains our, our spiritual energy, that is being flushed out. That is being released during the purgation period. And then we move from that purgation period into the period of illumination, where we start receiving, being infused with divine energy, learning, understanding more deeply, not just how we tend to operate, but how the spiritual structures and principles tend to be at work in the world, in other people, in organizations. The illumination period is of growth, wisdom, learning, expansion. Expansion on the level of the intellect, expansion on the level of the heart, expansion in the level of the soul, to be able to receive divine wisdom in ever greater capacities. Then is this night of spirit, or what's, what's oftentimes referred to as the dark night of the soul. Now, some people in a modern articulation, not a classical, will put this the dark night of the soul, kind of early on, and maybe even as part of the purgation period. But this stage is very specifically allocated in the classical tradition toward those who have been on the path for some time. They may experience a more passive path of a path of quiet, contemplative prayer, release, dryness, aridity, relinquishment. That's one path, or it might be a more, uh, manifesting path of um, ecstasies, visions, divine experiences, rapturous connection to God. Those are different strands within the Christian mystical tradition. But there's this kind of final fire. There's this kind of final intense experience of a suffering at a very deep level requiring the complete relinquishment into what John of the Cross called full union. So there's this understanding of process, movement, partial realization, partial union, a divine infusion, but still vestiges of ego identity and uh, desire and desire to be seen a certain way, desire for a prestigious role in the organization to live out my gifts and charisms as a speaker or a writer or an administrator and to be recognized for that on the level of the ego or small self instead of complete relinquishment and just allowing God at work in the soul to move us or not move us in the directions that are required now. There's still self prior to that dark night of the soul, which is kind of bandied about in culture in general when people go through a tough time or go through uh, a suffering, a loss that's quite profound or and go through a, a period of deep depression. Oftentimes people just kind of use that label I'm going through a dark night of the soul, or that was my dark night of the soul when my divorce happened, or my child passed, or um, some profound loss occurred. And yet, within this classical structure of uh, spiritual development, it's placed just prior to the experience of full divine union with the Godhead, where no longer I, but Christ in me, is an imminent, transcendent, day-to-day, moment-to-moment awareness, rather than being at an earlier stage on the path prior to arriving there. So, the night of sense, oftentimes, is what a lot of people refer to as the, the dark night of the soul, or the night of spirit, in this classical understanding. So I hope this is helpful for you. We're going to get another video going on modern levels of awakening and spiritual development. But we wanted to kind of lay the groundwork with a more classical understanding. And, and, and two books that can, can help if you're interested in diving a little deeper on this. 
One is An Invitation to Love by Father Thomas Keating, who puts it in very presentable, very accessible terms, and much denser look and then covers a lot of this tradition is the book it's just called Mysticism by Evelyn Underhill, this sort of classical uh, tome for the, the Christian mystical tradition specifically. So these two, uh, for me, were super helpful in, uh, in my own uh, journey when I first started along this path. And so don't forget, take a look at the link down below. If you're interested more in um, the, the Christian mystics, the contemplative tradition, check out the link below. There's, there's a free course and a, and a premium course, whatever your kind of appetite and desire is right now. Um, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button, leave a comment, share the video, interact, check us out at www.contemplativelight.com. And we've got a pretty active uh, group on Facebook as well. Head over there, facebook.com slash contemplative light. And for a lot of people who have a little too much baggage with their tradition, especially if they've moved out of Christianity for after a period of deconstruction and are kind of scrambling around, this can be a new avenue for them to explore that allows them to preserve some of their Christian tradition, language, and um, infused theology. Or it can be something that, that the language is just too big of a barrier, too much baggage, and they need to move on to something a little more contemporary and accessible without the baggage of the Christian language around it. And we'll, we're, we've got a video coming out for that as well.